San Francisco, 1870. A railroad passenger traveling to Washington State would have to set his watch over 200 times if he wanted to match the local time of every passing town. The world didn't have standard time yet. Each country, each city, sometimes each village kept its own time. Not too consequential until the advent of railroad travel and railroad schedules. On November 18, 1883, the railroads imposed a uniform time at the stations to end the confusion at the depots. The rest of the world soon followed. In 1884, representatives from around the world met in Washington, D.C. to establish a common standard for time. They divided Earth's surface into 24 regions called time zones. World Standard Time divides our timekeeping into tidy, uniform packages. But what exactly are we measuring? Is time part of our physical world? We can't see it, touch it, hear it. Yet, don't we all somehow feel it passing? What is time? On the one side, there is the time of the world. I'd say it ignores me completely. It is a time of millions, of millions of years, and human time is chopped up like a very thin branch out of this cosmic one. So what makes it time? It is the fact that we observe and measure it. Our lives are brief in comparison with the immensity of the world's history. Yet, as Ricoeur writes, there is the real paradox. On a cosmic scale, our lifespan is insignificant. Yet, this brief period of time when we appear in the world is the moment during which all meaningful questions arise. Uh, the lifespan of the Earth, several billion, billion years, the, the lifespan of the universe, uh, and then human time is such a tiny speck in there. But on the other hand, everything that is important happens in that tiny, tiny little bit of time. And now when we as human beings relate to the world around us, then time plays a very important role. Because when we structure the world, we don't structure it as just something that is there just now, but our structuring extends backwards and forwards through time. We encounter things in the world as having been there even before we set our eye on them and remaining there even when we turn to other things later. Is this division of time into past, present and future as neat and tidy as our date books make it out to be? Aristotle formulated one of the basic paradoxes of time. Time, whether limitless or any given length, is made up of the no longer and not yet. How can we conceive of that which is composed of non-existence? Uh, Aristotle, when he treats time in the physics, starts with a riddle that he never answers that goes something like this. Think about time as divided into the past, the present and the future. And then think for a while about what the present is. How thick is the present? The present is just a limit between the past and the future. And then you get the paradox. Uh, because the past is something that does not exist. It has existed, but it does not exist any longer. The future is something that does not exist. It will exist, but it doesn't exist. And the present is nothing. So time seems to be a nothing dividing something non-existent from something non-existent. J.M.E. McTaggart considered the ideas of past, present and future and wrote a pivotal essay called The Unreality of Time. McTaggart points out that however unnatural it may feel to assert that time is unreal, many thinkers have treated it as such, and he thought they were right. Past, present and future are incompatible determinations. Every event must be one or the other, but no event can be more than one. 
And it is because the distinctions of the past, present, and future seem to me to be essential for time that I regard time as unreal. MacTaggart's argument is that these notions are in some sense self-contradictory. And perhaps the easiest, thing, easiest way to uh, think about that is to think about the present. There's only one present. This moment is the only present moment. On the other hand, every moment is present. Uh, this, uh, how do we reconcile these things? What is unique about the present moment being present and now past? Does the present enjoy some sort of privileged status in terms of its reality? Or is temporal becoming just a subjective illusion of human consciousness? For persons in 2000 BC, that time is real and present. For persons in 2050, that time is real and present for them. For us, our time now is real and present. Is this just a subjective illusion? Or is there, in fact, some sort of privileged status, privileged reality that the present possesses, which the past and future do not? There are two basic views upon what a time is. Time, the present time, could consist of, of all the events that are occurring at present so that you and I, all our events and all our movements are part of time. Or time could be um, kind of a, a substance or a particular or a thing in its own right. And so when we just occupy that thing. So there are two different views of time there. One's called the relational view, where all the events that are going on now make up time. And the other is, is that time is, is this entity in its own right, and we were just occupying it. But are we too caught up with correlating words like past, present, and future to something real? Immanuel Kant thought that such a paradoxical thing as time could not really exist. Time, he asserted, is our own creation, the way our minds organize our experiences. The, I think Kant was the first person, the first philosopher to emphasize is that time seems to be basic to the way in which we structure reality. It is very hard to pinpoint anything in our experience that would account for our whole conception of time. Kant's solution was to say that there is something in us, in the way in which our mind works, that makes everything that we experience through our senses be located in time.